Pacific Bitcoin, good to see you. Um, thank you so much for welcoming me here. Today, I am really excited to give you guys a sneak peek of a project that I've been working on for a while, um, along with my colleagues at the Texas Bitcoin Foundation. So a little bit about us. We are a 501c3. Um, we are a charity organization dedicated to research and education about Bitcoin and political economy. Um, so I've led a, a number of lives. Um, in the recent past, I co-founded a startup that built um, some verification technologies on Bitcoin, um, exited that startup in 2020. We were the first Bitcoin exit in the world. Um, and that really took me down you know, an entrepreneurial path. But before I started on that path, I was actually an anthropologist uh, and a historian. And I'm particularly interested in questions of sovereignty, governance, and value. So I saw this time that we're living through together as an opportunity to think more deeply about the relationship between state and society and why Bitcoin matters. You know, so um, after I exited my company, I uh, worked with some of my friends and colleagues to found the Texas Blockchain Council. Um, we were a lobbying organization representing uh, the Bitcoin industry in Texas. And, you know, we, we had some successes, we got some bills passed, um, we're influencing policymakers. But the entire time, the, the bigger question kind of hanging in the background was, why does this matter? Like, why does decentralized money matter? Um, why does Bitcoin matter? Why does censorship resistance matter? Um, and so I found that, you know, I kept having to go upstream from policy discussions, from, you know, from tactics, which is the actual sausage making of the work of government, to um, the ideas behind it, and why sometimes legislation is not the answer, more law is not the answer. In fact, it can get in the way of some of the things we're trying to become as a people. So I saw the opportunity to create um, the Texas Bitcoin Foundation to begin answering some of these questions. And so the Satoshi Papers um, is the name of our first book, uh, scheduled to be published in 2024, next year. And um, we have some pretty awesome um, contributors and thinking that's gone into this work. So a lot of people ask, you know, why do we need Bitcoin? We already have money. Um, what is this new form of money supposedly doing for us that our current money cannot? Um, so this is where beginning to think through the relationship between money and the state, the relationship between state and society, and then relations between states, international relations, geopolitical balance of power, uh, becomes really important. I also want to thank um, my colleagues from the Bitcoin Policy Institute, uh, Grant McCarty, David Zell, and their team. They've generously supported um, our work at the foundation and, and the Satoshi Papers. So just a quick shout out to them. Um, our contributors. So you'll notice actually an, a number of our authors are themselves fellows at the BPI, um, including Dr. Sarah Kreps, Andrew Bailey, Craig Warmke, um, and myself. Um, we also have Tor Demeester uh, who's contributing. He sits on the board of the Texas uh, Bitcoin Foundation. Um, so it's really an all-star lineup. And now I want to tell you a little bit about my specific contribution. So I'm editing the book. I'm also writing a piece for it. And I thought I'd give you guys a little sneak peek of what that's about. So I don't know if you all remember, but I've been on Bitcoin Twitter for a while. And uh, back in 2018, there was a kind of standoff debate between, on the one hand, anthropologist David Graeber, and on the other hand, Nick Sabo, about what money is. And, and this debate was instigated by journalist Michael Casey, uh, who quote tweeted, 
um, Vitalik and said, you know, all, all you crypto gold bugs need to pay attention to what Vitalik is saying here because money, in fact, emerged as uh, a medium of exchange uh, before it was ever a store of value. And uh, Sabo replied, well, that seems to fly in the face of uh, a lot of anthropological evidence. Um, and so then the question became, well, so do you disagree with anthropologist David Graeber's theory of money as originating in credit? Um, and this prompted a whole back and forth. So as an anthropologist, I thought this was very interesting. And it, it got me digging into anthropological theories of money um, and how anthropologists have, in fact, thought of money. And I discovered somewhat uh, predictably, but also somewhat to my dismay, that within the discipline of cultural anthropology, there's sort of this pervasive sense that credit theories of money have won. Uh, and that state theories of money, you know, that, that we didn't really have true money until states started minting coins. Um, that is sort of the disciplinary consensus. And in fact, people invoke this as what anthropologists believe. And so I was like, wait a minute, I'm an anthropologist. I don't believe that. Someone needs to write about it. So that is exactly what I propose to do in, um, in my contribution. And in order to do this, you know, I had to go back to the, the debates about money that were really formative for not just anthropologists, but for economists and uh, sociologists and other social scientists. So in the early 20th century, there was, there was this debate um, between theorists of money who on the one hand posited that money is a creature of law, and on the other, who suggested money is in fact a emergent bottom-up phenomenon that crystallizes in any market. And, uh, you know, these are just a few examples. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with at least uh, Mr. von Mies, Mises and uh, Karl Menger over there. Um, but, you know, this, this debate was significant because, in fact, um, it fractured the social sciences and created uh, significant policy implications since, you know, in, in effect, the positions of power that Keynes was able to, um, to uh, acquire in his life ensured that the state theory, theory of money sort of became dominant and the dominantly accepted orthodoxy. Um, well, I think that calls for a revision. And so what I'm proposing in my paper is that we don't actually have to decide whether money is credit or money is a commodity. In fact, these are two different social technologies. Um, we get confused because they're both called money. And so it's easy to, to want to collapse them into the same thing. Um, but in fact, credit money and commodity money solve very different social problems. Specifically, credit money is tailor-made to facilitate exchange under conditions of high trust. And so if you are in a high trust situation, extending credit is no problem. In fact, it's much easier than bringing a commodity medium of exchange um, in, into the equation. But under conditions where trust breaks down or never existed to begin with, for example, trade with strangers, trade with enemies, um, or extremely high stakes social agreements, like for example, uh, a business venture, or a marriage, um, or other forms of contract around uh, transmission of property. At that point, people generally want to ratchet up the friction um, because the outcome of the exchange is so significant and momentous, both for themselves as individuals and for the wider social circles that they are a part of. 
And so what I'm suggesting is that the 20th century was sort of the apex of the credit theory of money um, and the state theory of money converging together. The state was able to use its monopoly, uh, ostensible, claimed uh, monopoly on violence to dictate what money is to a degree unprecedented in human history. Uh, states have been issuing money for thousands and thousands of years, but never before have they had such a strong monopoly on the issuance uh, and circulation of money. But we are beginning to see the limitations of the power of fiat. And when I say fiat, um, I mean law. So, of course, fiat is Latin for let it be done. It is the will of the sovereign. Um, the state theory of money suggests that money is a creature of law. And so wherever the, the rule of law obtains, um, whatever the state says goes. Well, what we are seeing in real time is the breakdown to the extent that fiat can in fact dictate value. And not coincidentally at all, we see emer emerging alongside it a, a new but actually very old type of money, commodity money, except now it's digital commodity money. Um, and that's, that's also something that throws people off. You know, people get really concerned about the form factor of the money. Well, it's digital. How can it be a, a commodity? Well, the commodity nature of Bitcoin is in the process of self-verification, the cost of verification that the proof-of-work protocol is achieving. And so what you're paying for, in effect, is the work of verification. Um, that is valuable in and of itself, uh, even though it's not uh, a tangible piece of matter that you can hold on to. And so I, I think this, this intervention, that money is, that in effect we, we always, as, as human beings, exist using two types of money, credit money and commodity money, for different things. I think that's actually a really important, although seemingly very simple and straightforward observation to make. Um, the other thing that the question of money touches on is the relationship between social institutions and individuals. So, you know, this, this here is just uh, an exemplary list of a few of the social theorists that I'm drawing on, you know, going back to the founder of the discipline of sociology, Emile Durkheim, uh, Marcel Mauss, um, arguably the most uh, influential anthropologist ever to live, um, Ronald Coase, of course, um, uh, well-known economist, Paul Bohannon, anthropologist, economic anthropologist, and Douglas North, um, economist uh, who sort of pioneered the new institutionalism uh, in economics. These people are all concerned with how human communities solve problems at scale. So um, what is an institution? When we talk about social institutions, what do we mean? Well, North proposed that an institution is a constraint that human beings um, agree to in order to uh, solve a social problem. So a constraint can be something like a norm, a value that we all share together. Um, like, this is good and this is bad. We agree on these things and we direct our behavior in light of those constraints. Uh, constraints can also be formal rules, they can be laws, um, they can literally be violence. Um, but all human social institutions solve problems by decreasing the costs of cooperation and increasing the costs of defection. And so this is how human beings cooperate, actually, is they create these constraints that um, then get institutionalized over time. That is important because when we talk about money, we're talking about an institution. Uh, you, you can use any type of money you want in a transaction, but your counterparties 
acceptance of that as a means of payment is ultimately what's going to determine whether or not you are able to, in fact, facilitate exchange using that means. And so, you know, the final contribution that my paper makes is introducing a distinction between payment and settlement. So, you know, I can pay you, but if you don't accept that payment as settling the debt that I owe you, then final settlement has not occurred. And it's this notion of settlement that has been under-theorized in the social sciences. So like the Bank for International Settlement, um, as I was alluding to earlier today, defines it entirely as a creature of law. Well, it sounds a lot like the state theory of money. And indeed it is. Um, it's positing that both money and payment and settlement are all, in, in the end, uh, legal, uh, within, within the ambit or jurisdiction of law to decide. But in fact, final settlement is a psychological process in which the creditor accepts payment of the debt and agrees that the debt has been settled. And it's that psychological process that no state, no human institution, whether it's you know, the family or the market or the firm or any other, they do not have final control over that element of the psychological ledger. Um, and so this leads to really interesting uh, and sometimes terrible social outcomes, like the blood feud, for example. Um, how do you repay a debt of a life? If, if a person is murdered, how can you ever repay their kin? Well, you, you really can't. There is an inestimable value to a human life. And so what happens is you get this um, vicious cycle of a ledger, a kind of tit-for-tat violence, where the ledger entries recursively accelerate and can never be finally settled. And so this is, this is where some of the earliest manifestations of the state take form. Their purpose is to simply end the blood feud, to end the cycle of vengeance between individuals and families. Um, but that final settlement, that sort of imposition on final settlement, is always uncertain. There, at any time, the creditor can decide that the debt has not been paid. And so my point in saying all this is that the rule of law is always resting more fundamentally upon the consensus of the community of law that the overall social ledger is characterized by a base fairness. Doesn't mean perfect equality, doesn't mean perfect fairness or perfect justice, whatever that might mean. But that generally, on the whole, there is the possibility of justice for those who have been wronged. When the community of law begins to lose faith in the structures of law as the mechanisms that deliver that justice, at that point, the law loses its ability to enforce final settlement and may also lose its ability to define what money is. And so that's uh, the Satoshi Papers, my friends. I'm going to ask uh, for your support. The Texas Bitcoin Foundation is a 501c3. We're a charity. We operate on a shoestring budget. This is entirely a labor of love for me. I make no money from it. I have a full-time software job that I work, and you know, not only do I not make money from this, I actually give my own money to support it. Um, so if you would be so kind, um, we would love to have any donations you could potentially give, and we look forward to delivering for you a fabulous book next year. Thank you. Oh, hi. Do you have your ticket to the next Pacific Bitcoin Festival? Join us as we shine a light on the best of Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. 
Visit PacificBitcoin.com for the best deal on tickets now. Thank you.